I want to give you guys a little blast from the past. I want you guys to think, all right, go back all the way to about maybe middle school, maybe high school, depending on where you went to school. Do you guys remember middle school PE? Do you guys remember middle school uh, gym and sports? you guys remember that? Play, maybe you like to play basketball. Maybe you enjoyed uh, dodgeball, dreaded dodgeball, right? Who invented that game, right? Uh, throw balls at each other's faces. And you guys remember when they used to split up into teams, right? You would have uh, captains. A captain would be chosen, and then the captain would split up into teams. Uh, you know, that's how we used to do it on the street back in the day. You should like, you, you shoot for captains, and then the captains would go ahead and select the team for either side. Uh, my middle school uh, nightmare is uh, flag football. I remember the days of playing flag football in the yard. So the, so the, the, uh, the leader, the captain, the team captain would look at you, right? And they would go ahead and make decisions on who they wanted to be on their team. They would, they would have to choose. Of course, you guys know this. This would create, man, all sorts of anxiety and, and stress, right? In your little middle school brain, right? Like thinking, like, are they going to choose me? Will they choose me to be on the team? Um, and when you were chosen, you felt great. If, you're, if your friend was the leader, if, you, if your best friend was like one of the team captains, then you knew it was a shoe in right? Like, you know, I'm, at least I'm going to be chosen first, if not second. At least I'm going to be on the team. I'm not going to be like the last guy that people are like fighting not to select, right? And when you were chosen to be a part of that team, it felt amazing. It felt great. Like, yes. But what happened to you if you weren't chosen or if you were the last one and you had to be on the team? It destroyed you, right? You felt heartbroken. You felt like your life was over, at least until lunchtime, right? When then you had your slice of pizza and then you were good to go. You know, the idea of being chosen, it helped you feel confident. It helped you feel significant. Yes, like, I could contribute to this team. They think I'm good enough to be on this team, right? But if they didn't choose you, if you weren't chosen, maybe you felt embarrassed. Maybe you felt ashamed, certainly discouraged. You know, the same idea carries into every single day life, right? If you think about it, if you're applying to be a part of a, you know, to be in an, enrolled in a university, in a college, you put out applications, you send out everything that you need to do, you put out, even spend the money that it takes in order to have your application accept, to, uh, accepted, but then you just receive this rejection letter. And you realize, oh man, this, this school of my choice hasn't chosen me. And it does something to you. What about if you're looking for work? You, you go on interviews, you submit resumes, and then you're not chosen again. I spoke to somebody um, this week who was putting in uh, resumes, and she said that, she was telling me that they weren't accepting her resume because she was overqualified for the positions that she was applying for. And she would get rejected over and over again because they told her she was overqualified for those positions. So imagine, man, like you put all these resumes out, you make these phone calls, and, and then you're just not chosen over and over and over again. And sometimes the fact that we get chosen or not, you know, it has huge ramifications on how we feel, on our emotions, even on our demeanor and how we behave. You know, sometimes we can even apply these feelings into our spiritual lives, in our relationship with God. God, why do I keep getting rejected over and over again? And we can even superimpose that feeling into our connection with God. God, I'm getting rejected from left and right, from family, friends, you know, from, you know, these applications. So, I mean, you know, I feel like you're rejecting me, God, as well. Why aren't you choosing me? Why are you rejecting me? And we superimpose that onto God as well. So we're going to talk a little bit more on that, on the idea of being chosen in a little while. But like I said earlier, we're wrapping up our series uh, through the book of Haggai. I just want to refresh your memories that God raised up a prophet named Haggai. A prophet is someone who communicates on behalf of God. And God raises up the prophet Haggai to call the people of God to rebuild the temple. And in the rebuilding of that temple, what God was saying was that he desires closeness. He desires relationship with the people. And so the people finally get to work, and in the process, God encourages them because they face opposition, and they face distractions, and they face discouragement. So God encourages them. 
You know, now sometimes when it comes to the act of rebuilding, because we, what, what we've said is that God is also calling us into this act of rebuilding, right? Whether it's your emotional life, physically, spiritually, uh, certainly and when it comes to the life of this church as well. God is calling us into a season of rebuilding. And sometimes in the act of rebuilding, we can say, man, can God actually be choosing me? Can God actually be calling me to be a part of that rebuilding? Can God actually choose me to be a part of that? And maybe you think to yourself, well, I, I haven't heard from God. Or, or maybe you think to yourself, well, what about all the difficulties that I've discovered along the way? Certainly all those obstacles and all those difficulties that I've come across along the way certainly means that God is not choosing me for the act of rebuilding. Well, this is what God is going to communicate to God's people. And in turn, I believe he's going to communicate this to us as well. As we wrap up our time in the book of Haggai, chapter 2, the last few verses in the chapter. The first thing that I think that God is going to teach us is this, number one in your notes. That is that God continually speaks. And it's not a question of whether or not God speaks. The question is, are you listening? God continually speaks. Are you listening? Here's what Haggai chapter 2 verse 20 says. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. The word of the Lord came to Haggai again. You see, throughout the book of Haggai, these small two chapters, this little book in the Old Testament, God has been communicating. God talks to Haggai and through Haggai. God talks to the people of God. God talks to the leaders. He talks to those that are in authority. God is constantly speaking. And as God speaks continually throughout the book, the question is not whether or not God is talking. The question is, are the people listening? You see, God speaks, but it's up to the people to listen. And here's a common theme that we see all throughout Scripture. A common theme throughout Scripture is not the silence of God, but it's the disobedience of the people when He does speak. And we see that over and over again throughout Scripture. It's not the fact that God is silent and that God is not talking to His people. God is constantly communicating, but what we see is the disobedience of the people. Or sometimes what we see throughout Scripture is that God speaks and people plug their ears because they don't like what they just heard. That's a common theme all throughout. You see, but throughout Haggai, God is speaking. And God is telling them, listen, I'm calling you to rebuild. He, he calls them, he communicates by rebuking them for their laziness and apathy. And then he gives them words of encouragement when they come across some discouraging times. And then he speaks, you guys remember this last week, a word of blessing over the people. He says, I want to bless you. I am with you. You see, when it comes to us and, and our desire to rebuild, we want to hear from God. In fact, one of the things that I've been praying for the most, I, I get asked over and over again, Danny, do you have any prayer requests? And what I'm constantly saying is I need clarity, I need vision, I need wisdom. I want to, in other words, what am I saying? I want to hear from God. I want Him to give me wisdom. I want Him to give me clarity. I want Him to give me vision. It's what I've been asking. And in rebuilding, we want to hear a word from God. But here's what I believe. I believe that God is constantly speaking. The question that we need to wrestle with today is are you listening? Are you listening? You see, in God's call to rebuild, are you disobeying? Are you ignoring? Are you plugging your ears to what God has to say because you don't like what he's telling you? You know, God speaks, but oftentimes we don't quiet our soul enough to hear from God, especially in a city like New York City that is constantly surrounded with distraction and with noise and, and sirens and people and, and the busyness of life. We don't quiet our soul long enough to hear from God. Or perhaps you don't want to hear from God in your moments of distress. Then you'll just tune them out. For some of us, sometimes we just want to wallow in our misery. We want to throw ourselves a pity party. And we don't want to listen to God because we're wallowing in our misery. God, I'm too busy being sad or being upset. So God, I don't want to hear. And when we, when we find ourselves in that place, then it's easy for us to drown out the voice of God. But listen, God is speaking. If you're willing to listen, God speaks constantly through His Word. 
God has been speaking to me tremendously through the book of Haggai. I pray that he's been communicating to you as well through the book of Haggai. God speaks through his people. And maybe he's been speaking to you throughout this series of rebuild as we talk about rebuilding your lives, rebuilding your soul, rebuilding your spiritual lives, and rebuilding this church. God has been speaking to you. So let me ask you, what is he telling you? Because God speaks. What is he communicating to your heart? What is he, what is he telling you? What is he asking of you? What is the Spirit prompting you to do? What is the Spirit prompting you towards? I need to clarify this because this is very important. There's a difference between hearing and listening. Many of us hear, but we do not listen. See, when you listen, it ultimately leads to action. It's not simply processing the information. Hearing is when the information goes in your ears. Listening is what you do with the information that you receive. And Swerve Church, God is speaking to us. And God is calling us to rebuild. Are you listening to the words of God? Are you listening to what he's telling you? Am I listening to what God is communicating? Here's the second thing from today's passage that we learned. And that is that God makes way to accomplish his purpose. God makes way to accomplish his purpose. Haggai chapter 2, verse 21 and 22 says this, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and destroy the power of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overturn chariots and their riders. Horses and their riders will fall each by his brother's sword. You know what God is saying here? You see, in, in, the, in, in the past, Israel's enemies had thwarted the plan of rebuilding in the past. They had gotten discouragement. They had received threats in the past from other Gentile nations around them who didn't want to see the rebuilding of the temple. And previously it worked. And God knows that in this time around in rebuilding the temple, God knows that those threats still loom. In fact, those threats are still a possibility and let's be honest, in all likelihood. But here's what God is saying. God is saying that he is going to step in and he, is, and he promises that he's going to protect. I'm going to overturn the chariots. I'm going to protect you is what God is saying against those threats, against those discouragements. Why? So that his process, so that his plans can come to fruition. You know, guys, you need to know this, that when it comes to rebuilding in every aspect of our lives and in rebuilding this church, you need to understand this that there will be obstacles in the process of rebuilding. It's not if, it's when. There will be obstacles, not only against battling ourselves. Of course, our own sinful flesh and our own sinful desires are constantly battling against our own selves. But remember, there's a spiritual enemy that we are, are battling against that doesn't want to see us succeed. And as real as God is, that is as real our spiritual enemy is and does not desire to see God's plans come to fruition in your life and in our lives. What are some of the obstacles that you'll face in rebuilding? You have to battle against the lies of the enemy who will tell you, who are you to try to rebuild your life? Who are you to try to bring this plan? This plan that God has given you is way bigger than, than you can possibly fathom or live up to. You have to battle against voices of discouragement of others, right? Those voices of discouragement. You know, you're in too deep. You know, you're, that, that sin that you committed has taken over your life. There's no way that God can use someone like you. You're never going to get out of this emotional hole that you put yourself in. You're never going to see the other side of this. Those voices of discouragement that we have to fight against. And of course, just the struggles of life. When we come to those roadblocks or when we come to those obstacles or those difficult situations in our lives, when we get to those roadblocks, we just think to ourselves, well, I'm just going to give up now. I'm just going to give in to the pain. Or God does not care about me to allow me to go through this, right? These are the things, these are the obstacles that we're going to face when it comes to rebuilding. But listen, God is communicating to Israel that he's going to make a way where there seems no way where the enemies are going to come in on their chariots and other nations are going to come and threaten and battle against Israel, God says, no, I'm going to make a way where there seems to be no way. I'm going to provide a way out from these enemies and these obstacles. 
And why is God going to do that? He's going to do it because ultimately it's going to fulfill His purposes. It's going to fulfill God's desire. And it's going to fulfill God's will. And here's what you need to know. The fulfillment of His purposes are for your greater good. God wants to do good in your life. But it's for His purposes. So if it appears that there are difficulties, if it appears that there's hardship, if it appears that there's obstacles or attacks, listen, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when you face opposition in the process of rebuilding. Because it's not if, it's when. Secondly, just know that God is going to make a way. And God's going to make a way because He will accomplish His purpose. He's going to accomplish His purpose. Do you have any reason to believe, if you look at the rest of of Scripture, the entire narrative of Scripture, do you have any reason to believe that God will not make a way? The same way God delivered Israel across the Red Sea, or Daniel from a lion's den, or how he delivered David from a giant, or how he delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from a furnace, or Paul from prison, or you and me from sin. God will make a way. He's going to make a way. We're going to face opposition. We're going to face obstacles and bumps in the road. It's not if, it's when. But just know that where it seems like there's no way, God will make a way to ultimately fulfill His purposes. And here's the last thing, number three. Number three is this. That's a God has chosen you. God has chosen you. Look at Haggai chapter 2, verse 23. On that day, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, and make you like my signet ring. For I have chosen you. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. I have chosen you. See, God reminds Zerubbabel, who was a a leader for the people of Israel, He reminds him that specifically He had called him to lead and to follow God's demands in rebuilding. I want you guys to put yourselves in the shoes of this leader here, right? Imagine how daunting and how hard this task is of leading the people to rebuild the temple. So God reminds him that he had chosen him for this time of rebuilding. Zerubbabel, I chose you to lead my people to do this, to accomplish this task. And God calls him his servant. He says God makes him like a signet ring. Do You guys know what a signet ring is? A signet ring was owned by kings. Kings owned those rings, and those rings were typically embedded with an emblem or a logo, and and, and it represented their authority, the authority of a king. It's how the kings would seal new laws and decrees. And it came straight from the office of royalty. If somebody saw the law or the decree and they had that seal, they knew it came straight from the office of the king, right? They knew it was him. And God was doing a couple different things by communicating this about Zerubbabel. First of all, he was reminding Zerubbabel that he comes from royalty. Because you see, Zerubbabel came from the line of David, which was from the line of the promised Messiah that would come. And so God was reminding him that he was sealed with the signet ring, that he was part of the lineage that would ultimately fulfill the promise of God in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But secondly, God had given him a special place of honor and authority for rebuilding the temple. And God says, I have chosen you. And here's the lesson for us, or the lesson here for us is that God has also chosen us. And we have the great privilege of also being called by God for His purposes for such a time as this. Because you see, God doesn't only save us from our mess, He doesn't only deliver us from our sin, but He invites us to be on mission with Him. He invites us into this rebuilding. And that signet ring means that He has marked you, that He has chosen you. Did you ever stop to consider this, guys? It just just came to my mind that you are alive in this time during a global pandemic, during one of the biggest crises of our lifetimes, And God chose you to live through it, to share the gospel, 
to, to be invited into the mission of God. He could have placed you in any time in history. But you're here now. God has chosen you. He's marked you. And if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, perhaps, and you think to yourself, man, there's, there's no way that God could have chosen me. I want to remind you guys about a parable that Jesus shares in the New Testament about a father and a son who the son decides to abandon the father, reject the father, and, and takes all of his father's money, and, and he goes far away, and the Bible says he squanders it on scandalous living, is what the Bible says. He spends every last penny of his father's money, and he's homeless on the streets, desiring the food of pigs. When he says, I'm going to return to my father's house, but when I go back, I know I'm unworthy of his love, and I'm unworthy of his acceptance, but I'm going to go back to my father's house and tell him and see if he'll just let me become a servant. And he returns home. And the, the Bible says that while he was still a far way off, the father sees his son and he runs to his son. And the Bible says he puts a robe on him, a new, new clothing, and he gives him a ring. He says, this is my son. And he welcomes him. He, he welcomes him home and he chooses his son and rejects that he had abandoned his father, and he just welcomes him home. If you're not a follower of Jesus here in this room or watching this on Facebook, I just want you to know that the Father welcomes you home. And if you're listening to me today, then God has also chosen you. I'm going to invite Hunter, would you come up here, Hunter, and lead us in one last song, and then I'm going to invite you all to participate in, uh, in communion. But I want this reminder to stick deep within your soul. God is constantly speaking. It's not a question of if he's speaking. The question is, are you listening? There's a big difference between hearing what God has to tell you and listening to what he says. Are we applying? Are we, are we obeying whatever God is communicating to us? And just realize this, that in the act of rebuilding, guys, we're going to face obstacles and hardships. So don't get surprised when you come across a bump in the road or when you come with fits of discouragement because God promises that He's going to make a way. For your good, yes. But even greater than that, to fulfill His purposes. And He's chosen you. He's chosen you for this time to rebuild, to join Him in the mission of seeking and saving the lost and inviting people into the family of God. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would give us ears to hear God because you are constantly speaking. You speak to us through your word you speak to us, God, through your people. And I know even right now as I pray, you are whispering into the hearts of the people in this room, God. You're communicating and you're talking. You're letting us know how deeply loved and cherished we are by you. And you are reminding us of the mission that you've called us to join you in. And so, God, as you talk to us, I pray, God, that you would give us obedient hearts, Father. That we may not harden our hearts to you, God. But that instead, Lord, we would obediently follow. God, I pray that you would make a way where there seems to be no way, God. When we come against those, those roadblocks, those those uh, fits of discouragement, God, when we come against the seemingly impossible, when we face the giant of, of how will we rebuild our lives, how will we rebuild our spiritual lives, how will we rebuild this church, Lord, how will we come out of this on the other side? And when we come against that roadblock and when we come against that wall, God, 
I pray that you would show us that you will make a way when there seems to be no way. God, because you are a way maker, God. God, I thank you for choosing us. God, you could have placed us in any moment in history, but in your sovereignty, you have decided to allow us to live, God, through this moment right here, through this time. And so, God, I pray that you would, by the power of your spirit, begin to make a shift in our minds, God, to not see this as a tragedy, but as a moment, as an opportunity, God, to make the name of Jesus known and to spread the gospel and to spread the love of Jesus to our neighbors and to provide the hope of Christ to those that are hurting the most. You have chosen us for that. And for that, we're grateful, God. Lastly, God, as as we conclude this series that has been personally challenging to me, and also encouraging. I pray, God, that you would help us rebuild. It looks daunting. It looks difficult. God, who are we kidding? It looks impossible. But God, with you, all things are possible, God. So would you help us rebuild every aspect of our lives? Lord, for those that are physically hurt, emotionally hurt, for our minds and our souls, and God, for the life of every person in this church, would you help us rebuild, God? We know, God, as as we obey you and as we rebuild, God, it will be for our good, but ultimately it will be for your glory, God. So would you receive all the glory from our rebuilding? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.